Today's episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Albert Lee Seed. Here at Back to the Roots, it is our goal to create connections with organic farmers across the country. Now we'd like to connect you with a leading provider of organic and non-GMO farm seed and Albert Lee Seed. Cover crops, forages, small grains, corn, and soybeans. Albert Lee Seed is helping organic and transitioning farmers diversify their crop rotations and create healthy herds, healthy soil, and healthy humans. Whether you're looking for organic oats for cover cropping, highly digestible alfalfa, or a 105-day non-GMO corn hybrid, Albert Lee has got you covered. In fact, they were the first farm seed company in the industry to offer guaranteed levels of non-GMO purity in their Viking corn and soybean line. Check out their website at www.alseed.com to see their farm seed lineup or to request a catalog. And thank you to Albert Lee Seed. You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, and along with Brian Wood, today we are in Walk-On, Iowa, on Prairie Star Farms with John and Megan Palmer. So thank you guys so much for being with us today. Appreciate you taking the time. So John, can you uh, give a little bit of an introduction and a history of your farm and, uh, you know, uh, family, farm size, and uh, just a little bit of a background? Um. My wife and I currently farm on the farm where she grew up. Her father started organic farming in the early 90s. I grew up just a few miles from here on a conventional dairy farm, and uh, I was always very interested in farming. Um, My mother passed away when she was very young, so organic farming wasn't something that my father transitioned to, but it was discussed when I was young because we were, obviously after a tragedy like that, we were just kind of all thinking about what, created this or is there something that can be done to to do something as a response to this rather than just carry on Um, my father ended up deciding to continue to farm conventionally but he started to take a a pretty serious look at how uh, how we were how we as kids were exposed to things and we were always kind of taught to be leery and stay away during certain activities on the farm and he did cut back on what he used in the fields and how he treated things in order to to feel like he made a made a change after that. Um, and then when I started dating Megan and was over here on this farm, I got to, that was my first exposure to organic farming directly. And I could see through what her father Merlin was doing, um, what was possible and kind of just, it, it made me start to think a little bit about what could be done. And I always had a strong feeling that I wanted to farm for my living. And, uh, Farming was starting to change and starting to get to where large scale was kind of the the push. So it was nice to see um, that there might be an opportunity to do something that would allow us as a family to stay at a scale that was comfortable for me and made me feel like farming was still going to be what I did and not manage and um, run an enterprise, which um, was not my goal. Mm-hmm. We actually started... Um, when we went on our own, we our first couple years was while we were still in college. Our daughter was born, and we were still going to college. And so we started renting um, a farm right next to my father, and we did grow conventional crops for a couple years. And if my mindset of wanting to do something different didn't convince me, those first couple years economically did, because uh, we were farming. Our first year, we farmed 75 acres. And with free machinery and no labor figured in, I made $500. Um, (laughs) Good thing we didn't have a whole lot of living expense at that point. But that was another thing that made me say, I need to to look at what other options are out there. I loved cows, and uh, milking was just something I was used to. I didn't know anything different. So that that was the avenue that we started to pursue. We were able to rent and eventually buy a farm that was actually nine miles from here. So our first 12 years of farming, we uh, we were on a different location than this. So this is kind of our second startup now. We've been here for, what now, three, going on, going on four years. 
Um, so we're kind of in a, we've had a chance to do it once and then, and then say, oh, maybe we should have done it a little different and, and had an opportunity to, to make some changes and, mm-hmm. and start a second time. So the farm here was not a dairy farm? This, this farm was a dairy farm, and then it was a pig farm. And then I helped my father-in-law start milking here again when Megan and I first were married. And it was an organic dairy farm from 2001 until, um, until today. There was, a, there was a short break in there between the time when, when her father um, passed away and, and the hired man that was milking here moved to Wisconsin and continued to organic dairy up there. There was just a little break in there where there weren't any cows milked here, but it's been an, it's been an OV dairy farm since about 2001. Okay. And, and your your dairy farm at the other location, that was organic milk as well? That was OV as well, okay. yes. We, we transitioned that farm, and we started milking there in 2005, no, 2004, and then we bought it in 2005, and then we were shipping with Organic Valley in 2006. Mm-hmm. So. And what scale are you at here on this farm as far as cow size, and how, how many acres are you farming? Uh, we're farming about 500 acres, and the milking herd um, is about 125 to 140 is kind of where we're going this fall. Um, and we're able to produce all of our own feed for the most part now. Um, the cows are grazed. Um, everything everything that we would graze with the cows is here on the home farm, and most of our, our work ground is within just a few miles. Okay. So... So when you, you said you grew up on a conventional farm and, um, were you grazing at the home farm? Every fall we would, after the crops were out, we would open the gates and we would let the cows go and the cows would have the whole farm. But it was a, it was a confinement farm other than that time of year. And that time of year we all loved because chores got really easy and the cows were super happy. Um, the big challenge was just getting them to come home to get milked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now, obviously, you have requirements for grazing. Um, What avenues did you take to get learned up on grazing? And was it just kind of a trial by error? uh, Or did you have some people that you went after to talk to? Uh, We we worked with uh, um, the FSA office, the NRCS office. There was a, um, there was a, grazing was already big enough by the time we started that they had some data, some some ideas, recommendations. So um, we were able to, on the on the farm that we were on previously and this farm, we used equip funding to help set up lanes and um, build fences and block the farm up and kind of set up a set up a plan. Um, as far as and then the first herd of cows that we bought and we started with, they came from. Um, from a couple that were grazing. They weren't intensively rotationally grazing, but they had several paddocks and they were rotating. So our cows were used to going out. It wasn't like we had to train the cows what we wanted them to do when we first started milking. And um, when, when we first started, I, I built the first pasture the day that the cows came. <laughs> and then and then every couple of days I had to make sure I got enough fence built to get the cows on a new pasture for that first month that they were on the farm. Um, so we had help, but every farm is obviously different and you learn what grows where and how the cows are going to, how the cows are going to, what areas they're going to want to congregate in. And so just like everybody who does it, we had to kind of learn on our own mm-hmm. too as time went on. Mm-hmm. But now you almost had to relearn some of the things because you were on a new farm because yeah. what grew there <laughs> on the hills might not grow here. Yeah, the farm that we were on was, uh, it was a lot more flat and it was very deep soils. Um, and now we're a little bit more in the hill country and this farm had been broken up a lot with permanent pastures over the years and manure didn't get to certain areas because well that meant going around and taking the long road and we all know that the manure spreader turns on the quickest as soon as it gets (laughs) out the gate um so we've had to uh we've we've really changed a lot of things on this farm in terms of every bit of fence was torn out and then I had to look at it after it was an open area and say, okay, how would I do this now without that old fence line 
being a mental barrier to mm-hmm. to changing things. So, but we we did kind of the same thing here. We can't have nice square pastures that are easier to break up and and uh, easier for clipping. And oh, we want to throw corn in there. Okay, well we just we just do it here. It's a little different because we have more hills, um, but we've a, we've been able to. Um, it took us a couple. There's been a few changes where we said, "Oh, I I wish this was a little smaller. We need another fence here in order to make brake wires not so terribly long that I can't see where I'm going when I start." Um, but we've got this farm to where I'm I'm pretty comfortable with the grazing setup that we have here now. How many acres do you have for for pasture in a normal year for the milk cows? Um, the the milk cows have approximately. Um, there's 80 acres that is pretty much always in grazing for them, and then there's another 30 acres that can be put in as the, in the later part of the season, like where we are now. Mm-hmm. If the pastures aren't aren't uh, producing enough, we can flex that in, or we can leave it as as hay ground and and harvest it. And then our dry cows don't follow the cows, but as the dry cow herd and the milk herd vary in size. Part of the acres get pushed towards the dry cow grazing, and as that herd gets larger, they get a they get a bigger share of the acres. And then as the milk milk herd gets bigger, they get it back. So, are you year year round calving, or are you stronger in fall or spring? Right now, we're very strong fall. Okay, um, yeah. we'll calve two thirds approximately of our cows in the fall, and then we try to do basically a february through may june and then start in mid to late august and hope to be done by early november Um, but there's always stragglers and we're not trying to be exclusively seasonal but it would be nice Mm -hmm. be nice if you could group everything in a three-week window right yeah yeah we're we're setting up we group feed all the calves and it's the challenging time are always the late calves where it's like oh here's another one and do we put her in with the ones that are three weeks old or do we raise her as an individual for a while and it it's not as much it's not as much fun and chores get to be more complicated as the calving season drags out so do you you said the 80 acres is pretty much exclusively always pasture for the cows do you do any pasture renovations on that with with say a summer annual or something like that on this farm, we have not yet. At the other farm, we did. And because that farm was flatter, it was easier to do over there because it was a lot easier to just say, well, we're going to just take that out and plant. Um, over there, we put corn on. On uh, those acres was our normal. I did sorghum Sudan, and I was just kind of starting to do more experimenting with summer annuals um, when we moved. And now it's been kind of a mad dash to just get everything to where it works. And thankfully, the pastures haven't gotten to the point where they need it yet. But my hope is to get to where about every five to seven years, if they need it, I have a plan of probably like sorghum Sudan or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, every You hear a lot of conflicting ideas. Um, I always saw a, a nice improvement in the pasture when I would renovate it and then bring it back. Um, I've heard it said that if you can just just ride out the the lull in there that at some point the six year point yeah it the, seems that right the pasture there. matures and the soil gets to a point where renovation is something you'd shun and say i can i'll never tear that up that's beautiful so i'm i would i would love it if that was true mm-hmm. i mean I, I would like to get to the point where i didn't ever feel like i really needed to disturb the pasture because and fences and everything just stay and it's mm-hmm. don't worry about how do I farm this on the contour so I keep the soil here? And mm-hmm. it's nice to just leave it. Mm-hmm. I think it was Joe Schlabel who was talking about the six year you kind of bottom out on pasture, seven year it starts getting a little bit better and then it comes back. Uh, but I did see he does some renovating now, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if. Uh, and I think it has <clears throat> so much to do with your soil. You know, what what is your soil health? Is there is it alive? You know, uh, but I see a lot of people renovate with a summer annual or something. If especially if they're grass milk, if they if they can get mm. corn in there, 
that's kind of nice, especially corn silage. Take that off, go in with something for fall grazing mm. than a seeding. So uh, I would say majority of the farmers I talk to are still in renovation mode. Uh, I think a lot of them are maybe using one field way back off the road to not renovate, to see how that oh. works out. Because mm-hmm. most of them don't want to do that right next to the road. Yeah. Where everybody can see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I think... I, I like alfalfa as a as a part of my pastures, and another thing that we've kind of debated is clipping, and how much should a person clip? And I'm after this season, uh, I've kind of decided I should really be following and clipping better because if I want to keep alfalfa or keep the legumes up, um, I think it would be beneficial to be cutting them off more like a haybine does. Because it seems like otherwise they just turn into a bush and they kind of say I'm seeding and then don't really do much. Mm-hmm. And it, I think that if a person can keep the pastures clipped at least a couple times a year to make it a little bit more like it's a hay field, um, it'll help be help in making the alfalfa more persistent. We tried. Uh, we did a little bit of cutting before grazing, a little cut ahead. Joe Klein uh, encouraged that. He said he's got quite a few guys who are doing a fair amount of that. And I actually really enjoyed the experience, but then it was so blasted wet, and I didn't want to cut and then have it rain on it three times before the cows got there and having the haybine just stay out in the field and just, I, I just didn't, mm-hmm. the year just didn't end up being um, the right year to, to do more of that. But I think that is possibly something that will try to do more of because i really liked cutting the pasture with a with a disc bind versus like a flail cutter because it because of the way it cuts and Clean it seems like cut. it seems like the plants just prefer that mm-hmm. and want to come back a lot better and i think the health of the plants is better that way mm-hmm. i saw this year i saw more pre-clipping ahead of the cows than ever before because it was so wet they couldn't turn the cows out then all of a sudden the pastures were too tall and they couldn't get their grazing wedge going so with pre-clipping they could get that grazing wedge going and they actually the cows would eat more of it if it was mm-hmm. clipped because some of it was you know it went from too wet to get into seed heads in uh, 10 days or so mm-hmm. i think we'll see more of that uh going forward on especially on the amish farms who use just the like the i and j double sickle bar mower that mows pretty much same as a disc bind nice clean cut and it's really simple for them to go out there and do it with it. I think we'll see more and more of that, especially just to get that, get your rotation going so you're in your cycle the next time through. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of rotation, like you were saying, trying to get corn in some of your pastures, but uh, not necessarily able to. But as far as on your ground that you're row cropping, what are you doing for a rotation? Um, like as far as corn, are you growing beans and uh, small grains or anything like that? We gained some acres over the last couple of years with the move, and we've had we've had several neighbors come to us and request, well, ask us if we would be interested in running their farm. Um, this last year, we had two smaller parcels that came to us, and so this is the first year I'm growing beans. Um, it's being grown on 10-year ground. The rest of the farm, um, our rotation to this point has been one-year hay, one-year corn, then seeded down um, to alfalfa with oats as a cover crop. Um, we also grew some rye acres this year, so we're starting to play with our rotation a little a little bit. Um, my goal would be to keep the ground in hay for at least two years as we have the acreage to do it. And we'll see how the beans go this year. Um, to some extent, I I, I kind of said I would never grow beans, and then this year it was just the way to the way to use these farms and um, and not have too many acres of something to deal with. And we do feed some protein in the winter, so uh, it was an opportunity to produce that for ourselves instead of having to buy it. Um, our experience with growing corn, we've We've been fortunate to some degree, like the farm that we started on where we first grew organic corn was a very clean farm. As far as ragweed went, we really didn't have a ragweed issue to deal with. And what we had, we just tried to stay on top of right away. When we came to this farm that had been farmed organically for a long time, 
and has terraces. And in my mind, I think terraces created ragweed uh, because wherever terraces are, it seems like ragweed is is an issue if it's going to be an issue anywhere. Um, so this farm, I was really, I was actually terrified of growing corn on this farm because of ragweed. Um, the first time that I had to tear something up that was supposed to be corn here and we still lived at the other farm I couldn't even do it I actually planted sorghum Sudan because I was like (laughs) I gotta have something I can just go in there with a mower and cut this off because I'm not gonna deal with with this corn that's gonna be so much ragweed Um, but then we since then we obviously we've grown corn here and we've had for several years we had uh, weed walkers come in and pull ragweed and I guess our the cultivation system that we use. Um, I don't really understand exactly why it is. Uh, it's so much better, but I feel like we get a really good kill with. It. We have front mount old John Deere AT40 cultivators on 3020s, and you can see what you're doing, and you can get in there when it's really small. And we still have weeds, we still have ragweed, but. Um, like this year it was a small enough project that my wife Megan did most of the walking of the field. Um, and between the two of us in the evening and what she did during the day, we got through um, 20 acres that were really bad and the rest of it just to hopefully keep it from getting worse. Um, so I guess that's kind of been my experience with uh, with ragweed in the corn. And I, I definitely think if you have it, the only way you're ever going to beat it is to you got to prevent it from going to seed mm-hmm. every year and it's going to feel like it's never going to end uh gary welsh who lives not too far from here has been having weed walkers do for at least seven maybe ten years and he said once you get past about six or seven years things really change and you you kind of get ahead of that seed bank so our hope is that we can get to that point mm-hmm now, what have you seen with weeds in the beans? Um, the beans have, that was in tenure for like 20-some years, and there are a very few ragweed. The The biggest, on the one farm, wherever there was a lot of livestock manure or like cattle lanes and things, there's a lot of buttonweed, um, and that's really the only weed that's a problem there other than brush from it being brushy when we plowed it. Um, the other farm has some buttonweed and and then some foxtail grass, but nothing nothing terrible, thankfully, mm-hmm. on either of those farms. I plowed it really early th- and thought I was going to be really ahead of the game when it came to uh, getting ready for spring. We were having a pretty normal-seeming spring, and moisture was about what you expected, and then I got that plowed, and then it started raining, and for a month it sat there, and we really couldn't do anything. I think that probably helped us because we had a pretty long window between plowing and when we were able to get in and work it again. Mm -hmm. And then we worked it, disked it, and then it rained again for a week or 10 days before we could do anything again and plant it. So it didn't get planted until like about the 8th, 9th of June, which isn't isn't really late, but it was a lot later than I thought I would be able to kind of have it prepped. And I think that helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. Because that working it, letting the little white rooted weeds get going, and then hitting it again got rid of a lot of that. Yeah, the small weeds. Yeah, it was it was phenomenally clean um, until in the last few weeks. You know, things are starting to because we're on thirty eight inch rows, and the bean that we planted in places is within probably eight inches of canopying, but there's there's no solid canopy anywhere so there's still there's still dirt that's seeing sunlight in between the rows Mm -hmm. you do the corn on 38 as well Mm -hmm. we that's the equipment we bought and i guess i don't know i'm i like having the tires on the tractor set out wide we're in steep enough hills that Mm -hmm. i just i prefer it and i love my at40 front mount cultivators and i don't want to have to stop using them so Mm -hmm. now those are mounted on the front of the tractor not a belly mount well, they're a bell. I a belly band. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The shovels are just ahead of the mm-hmm. rear tires. So you can look straight down and see exactly what you're doing because yeah. we all know what happens when you turn your head and you look back. <laughs> all of a sudden, you've got <laughs> six rows or whatever that are gone. Yeah. The old cultivator blight. Yeah. Uh, 
and it's only four rows wide, which is kind of frustrating because it's only four rows wide. We plant with an eight, eight row planter, but at the same time, it's really easy to watch what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And if a shovel gets loose and slides or, a, you know, something plugs up, you're, you're able to catch it pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I appreciate the comment about a 3020. I grew up with a 3020 mm-hmm. and thought it was the best tractor ever. It still is. <laughs> it still a, is. A 4020 might, I don't know. Either one of them. I'm old enough to remember when the 4020 was the monster. Like, that was the big tractor, and now you see it on a rake. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is that all you're doing for, for um, weed control, is just using the cultivator, or what What else, what other no, tools we, do you have? We we plant, and then, assuming the weather cooperates, we have a tying harrow, a three-point tine harrow, and we'll try to harrow it at five to seven days, you know, just before it's spiking. And then in the last, I used to be really afraid of rotary hoeing because growing up, we only rotary hoed when we had a disaster. And uh, and it was always a thought of we're killing the corn whenever we were using it. Um, we're saving it and killing it at the same time. Um, so now, now I've, I've, I was renting a farm from uh, a renting part of a farm and I was watching an older gentleman who farmed organically um, and he rotary hoed every year and I watched him do it and I would say, oh, it looks like he's hurting things, but then I would come back later and his corn looked amazing. And so finally I realized that rotary hoeing was not not what I grew up with. So we'd rotary hoe also at about a week to two weeks after that, depending on corn height, and then we and then we cultivate. And usually we cultivate twice. And the last time through, it's usually within a week of canopying. So so when you rotary hoe when the corn's up, do you go slower than if you would rotary hoe before the corn's spiking? No, usually I go like crazy because okay. I want to get it done. Okay. And I'm only covering four rows again. Oh, okay. I don't have a big rotary hoe. So whenever I'm doing weed control, other than, with, I mean, with the cultivator, obviously you have to go slow. Like with the harrow and the rotary hoe, I'm going as, as fast as I can control mm-hmm. and it's it's never smart to look back when you're rotary hoeing because you're <laughs> convinced that you just killed every plant that's up <laughs> i had one year where i i sent somebody else to go and do a field and i had it set for depth you know for how hard the soil was where we were working and then he went and started on another farm and when i showed up i was i I was absolutely mortified i thought literally i was gonna have to tear it up and replant it but it was late enough that i was like and I was busy, so I went and farmed and just kind of tried to forget about it. And the next time I went back, I couldn't believe. I, th- I thought the corn was gone, and it, and it had come back. So that made me – I've seen corn do amazing things over and over as far as when you're cultivating, thinking that it looks like, oh, this isn't going to pan out or be very good. And um, it seems like nine times out of ten, it's, it's tougher and better, better able to come through it than I would have expected. Have you done any, I know you're just kind of playing around with beans right now. Did you do a similar program with beans? Yeah, we did the same thing. There was one, one of the farms I was able to get, um, get harrowed before they came up and then it started raining and I didn't get the other farm done. Uh, I did not rotary hoe the beans. Um, Gary Welsh is kind of my go-to person for anything I haven't done. I asked him about, and he said, we don't rotary hoe beans anymore. Um, so I didn't. And with our cultivators being able to get in there, we were able to go when the beans were really small, and uh, and we were and thankfully they were. We got it. Pounding rain is funny. It, it on one hand it, it can make weed control a problem, but I, in some ways I almost feel like pounding rain sometimes seems like it has proven to be helpful with weed control too. Um, probably because it's washing, washing and moving the ground so much that it disturbs things. Um, and kind of acts as another, another cultivation. So Mm -hmm. how come not rotary hoeing beans? What was their thinking behind? Because, because when they're in that hook stage or even slightly after that, when you break them off at that stage, you've, I mean, my understanding is that then, then they're done. You know, if you break off the plant before it gets up to where it has several growing points, then you're you've killed it and you've thinned your stand and then then that opens opens the window for more light in the row and grass in the row and from what i was everything i've 
heard or from other people who have done it, if you can keep the grass out of the row, that's your that's your best opportunity to have a decent crop of beans, especially if it turns dry. So. I think it was, I talked to Gary McDonald, the cultivator guy from, I think he's from Illinois. Or, mm-hmm. And he's did a presentation on cultivating beans where you couldn't even, I didn't realize there were beans in the field. And mm-hmm. he said he probably got rid of between 10 and 20% of the stand, but he actually ended up gaining yield. Mm-hmm. And he said anybody can cultivate in between the rows. He said, that's not going to, con- you know, that's not going to hinder your yield with weeds right in between the row. He said, it's the stuff in the row that you need to get, which he said, now that's where it gets complicated. So did, did he have a, like a optically guided cultivator? No. Uh, he actually builds his own. He gets an international, buys two old internationals and makes one cultivator out of it. And the gangs are like six feet long, so the trash can get through and not plug. And he's got them spread apart, I think, inch and a half on either side. So he's got an inch and a half. And he said GPS guidance isn't true enough. That I So think, how does he guide? Watch. Okay. And But it's a back-mounted cultivator, but he's got a guide out down on the row. So he sits there and he said, you just watch that. He said, because if, if you're worried about your cultivator plugging and you've got to look back, he said, you're going to do horrible things but he said it's never good to even look at the part of the field that he's done because he said you won't think it'll ever recover because he said i destroy everything he said come back three days later and it looks completely different it was fascinating i never thought i could sit in a three-hour presentation about cultivating because i grew up cultivating on a horse-drawn cultivator one row at a time and hated it but it was really cool what he can do with weedy fields, just with cultivator set up. And, but, you know, he's OCD when it comes to cultivating, which you almost need to be. So is he in flat country where everything is just straight yeah. back and forth mm-hmm. then? Yeah, yeah. I, that, would, that, that would definitely change my, my setup because we stay four row for the reason that we're in, mm-hmm. in contours, in hills where we have waterways and we have point rows and... Um, as our farm grows a little bit and I, and we don't need to push the acres as much, I'd really like to start leaving, trying to just have all the rows just run out on the end and not using um, not using point rows and stuff, just working the field in a way that we say that those acres are just going to stay in some forage and and uh, and not chase after the the corners mm-hmm. as much. Yeah, I think when you talk to like a Gary McDonald who's in flat country with six feet of topsoil, that's a totally different ball game than on contours like you are here. Uh, there's one farmer in Ohio that has land very similar to this area, and he uses the belly mount for a row as well. Because mm-hmm. uh, he said anything, anytime he's on the side of the hill, he said that three point will want to drift a little bit, and he said you can set it a lot tighter uh, mm-hmm. with the front mount. Yeah. Do you do any, you don't do any flame weeding or anything like that? I have a flame weeder and I have used it in the past, but I have not used it for years. Okay. Um, I won't say that I, I, I had, uh, I had good experience with it, but when I did test strips where I did it versus didn't, I felt like it, it, uh, set the corn back in terms of getting the canopy and, um, Yield wise, I guess I didn't do a check enough to know whether I hurt the yield, but I figured that the way it set the corn back um, in growth and getting to where it was canopying, um, and it, it it's kind of a I don't know it, it it was a job that I I didn't love doing, so if I could avoid it, I did. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of corn do you? What day corn do you plant here? Uh, usually from ninety eight to one hundred and three. Okay. And we we will chop some corn um, this year because I think we're going to be probably shorter of forage than we have been the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So you normally don't chop much of your corn. Uh, we've we used to chop um, more because we were on a smaller acreage base. Last year we chopped a small amount and we ran out of it right in the spring, like what our what our plan was. But then. With this year as wet as it's been, and uh, 
the way the hay just doesn't seem to be yielding as well this year and we had burned through all of our excess forage last winter with the long cold winter and uh this summer i kind of was wishing that i had that extra feed through the grazing season so this year we're going to make sure that we make a little more so that we don't depending on what the winter is we don't get to spring and feel like not only are we short of feed but we didn't have the extra feed from the previous year to to carry us through Mm -hmm. but otherwise you'll dry corn down and combine it and use it all yourself or are you selling some off the farm uh when we were running both of the farms we did sell corn but as of now we're pretty much just feeding everything if we do sell it's a small amount and dry corn is another last year we dried all of our corn i don't really like feeding dry corn to the cows as well because i see so much of it in their manure and uh this year if i can get the machinery lined up and have the chance to do it with a larger number of cows i'm less concerned about bagging high moisture corn and keeping ahead of it the reason we kind of went away from it was when we were milking 80 cows or even 100 cows it seemed like it was hard to keep up with the spoilage when it got to the warm time of of the next spring and so it got to where we were making a small enough amount that we just kind of said well we have drying equipment we'll just dry it and grind it Um, but I think we lose a lot in terms of cow performance by having dry corn versus wet corn Mm -hmm. and why dry it and then wish it was wet it just (laughs) seems silly Mm-hmm. But you do all your own harvesting. You have all your own, your full line of equipment to do all the work yourself. We don't have a chopper, so we've we have a somebody custom chop for us. But everything else we have our own. Mm-hmm. And you put it in bags or uprights? Uh bags. This farm doesn't have any upright okay. silos. So. And speaking of cow performance, what kind of production? Are, well, what breed of cows do you have, and uh, what kind of production are you getting? Mostly our herd is Holsteins. We do have, uh, we have a significant number, but it's still small of purebred um, brown Swiss. And we have some shorthorns that we're kind of doing as a project for um, my sister-in-law um, isn't farming, but kind of wishes she was. And she loved shorthorn cows, so we're keeping some shorthorn cows for her. Um, milk production is uh, around 20,000 is a is our rolling herd average. I think it's going to be down significantly this year. It just seemed like it was a harder summer to get the cows to milk. Part of that was all dry corn and I think the test weight on the corn or something about the corn just didn't seem like, it seemed like you had to feed more of it to get the same results out of the cows. And we're, um, last year we had feed from the previous year, which was a little more normal weather year. And it seemed like the feed had more milk in it. And so last summer we had a little carryover feed that helped kind of average out the feed of of last summer, which was a wet year like this year. Whereas this year, if you had anything left, it's a wet year feed. This year is all wet year feed. Protein levels are a lot lower, especially on the early stuff. And uh, so I'm I'm hoping next year isn't another year like the last two. Mm -hmm. Now, do you raise all your replacements and everything here on this farm? Yeah, we uh, we have remote pastures that they go to in the summer, but everything uh, everything is everything that we're going to milk is raised here. We've started genomic testing in the last couple of years, and we're trying to move towards only breeding for enough replacements for what we want to milk, rather than raising them all and then ending up weeding them out after they've eaten a lot of feed. Um, and the price on re- selling replacements is not paying for itself. No, um, and and that way we can also make bull calves that are that are black or you know something that hopefully makes that that calf worth a little bit more than a Holstein calf as well. Um, so we're trying we're trying yes we raise everything that we're gonna that we're gonna use as replacements, but we're trying to get that number down as small as we can. It, with the tough economic times, it just is a pet peeve of mine when I'm on farms and, oh, yeah, we kept all of our calves this year. You know, we, we, we're we not going to just sell them for, I got a bill for $12 to sell that calf. I'm like, well, you're going to put a couple thousand dollars worth of feed in it before you get 
eight hundred bucks for it. So <laughs> I'd take the twelve dollar <laughs> loss now yeah. and just move on. And then the second thing with keeping bull calves, you know, I've heard that too. Um, it takes two years to get a return out of that animal, at least. Yeah. And they're not seeing it. So. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think as high as feed costs were last winter because of shortages. I think they're. I think availability of of conventional and organic hay is going to be tight but especially organic this mm-hmm. winter and prices are going to be going to be high so if you're feeding something that you're not going to that you don't need and isn't going to make you money it's going to just cost you that much more mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your comment about black bull calves we have a lot of people that are breeding the cows they don't want offspring off of uh to angus and anything that throws a black calf because you take a Jersey bull calf to the auction, you'll get a bill. And if you send an all black bull calf, you'll get a couple hundred bucks for it. Mm-hmm. So uh, it just makes sense to try to value add on your cows that you're not crazy about. You don't, I realize that the bottom end cows always have heifer calves. I mean, that's <laughs> the way it works. <laughs> but I like the idea of using something that'll throw a, a bull calf with value. Yeah. Yeah, and we do. We are we're using some sex semen in order to make it so that the, you know, the number of the number of Holstein bulls that we have to deal with will hopefully be pretty small. We're fortunate we have a private buyer who buys them currently, but he's about ready to quit, and he was always very fair to us. He appreciated our colostrum management and the health of the calves when they came and that he didn't have to go to the sale barn. Um, but when we don't have that and we just have to take them to the sale barn, it'll be that much more painful to take calves to there. Mm-hmm. I've heard of, I've heard many stories this summer of people taking calves that are weaned and averaging $50 a head. And for us feeding organic milk, that really doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you doing any uh, A to A two breeding or pulled? Yeah, actually, we we select all of our bulls are are A two and pulled, and we've been breeding for A two and pulled for at least seven years. Um, oh, really? And there was a little, there was a, a short time in there where there were a few bulls we used that that were not um, pulled, but we've been trying to use all A two A two for. For that long, um, one of my brothers is uh, his. He's been into cow genetics since he was eight years old, and he kind of got me started on it. And he he was selecting all my bulls for a while when he was working for us, and he got us started on that. And as I've kind of I see the market, the marketplace is kind of trying to digest what that what that's going to mean for us all. But uh, it was we made the decision that pulled was an absolute. Uh, that was an easy decision to say we're just going to use pulled. We're almost uh, we're to the point where we're starting to have homozygous calves, homozygous pulled calves be born now. So pretty soon here we'll be able to start using some non-pulled bulls and still have pulled calves. But last fall, this spring, probably about seventy-five percent of our calves that were born were born pulled, and um, I guess you don't really realize how how much. Uh, how much of a job and how hard on the animals uh, dehorning is, whether you're using dullet and lidocaine and all that stuff, you don't understand how hard it is on that animal and you until you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's really fun to go through and say, okay, who do we have to dehorn and have it be like, oh, it's just one or two. That's so much fun. The only thing that would be better is if you could just say they're all Mm -hmm. pulled and we don't have to deal with it. Um, And the A2A2 thing, um, that was it was a little harder decision to do that early on because with those two criteria our bull pool that we could choose from was really small and like now when we genomic test um our our merit dollars and our milk numbers and things aren't nearly as high as they probably would be if we'd had other bulls as options but i guess i look at our milk production at 20,000 pounds an organic herd and i say you know, we were never trying to push for 30,000 pounds of milk. Obviously, we're going to be grazing these animals and not not optimizing their milk performance anyway. So it was, an, it was a cost that I was willing to incur in order to, to have a herd that 
if all of a sudden somebody says, hey, I'm going to give you $30 of hunter weight for A2 milk, I want to be one of the first guys that can stand up and say, I'm over here. Mm-hmm. So. And you said the, the toll it takes on the animal, the dehorn, it takes a toll on the people that do it too. It's not fun. Mm-mm. And to grab that little calf's head and not feel anything is pretty neat. Yeah, it is. Are you seeing the bull selection with those two criteria really start to get back to where oh. you would like it to be? Yeah, I mean, at the at the annual meeting, somebody stood up and talked about how there just there weren't bulls available, and I almost had to stand up and say, "Well, where are you looking?" Because every catalog that comes out now has more new releases than the last one i mean obviously there's bulls that fall off but there there's a huge number of bulls available that meet both of those criteria now um and and they're starting to get to be some outcrosses i mean for a long time it seemed like the number of the genetic background on a lot of them was very similar so there was a little bit of concern of making sure that you didn't fall into an inbreeding problem but now there's there's more family lines that are showing up that they've gotten gotten pulled into so inbreeding is less of a problem and and even like other traits milk production components is another thing that we're breeding for heavily you don't have to compromise nearly as much as you used Mm -hmm. to in order to you know i had i had numerous farmers that i talked to about the pull genetics and they're like well they've been working on genetics for so long that they're not willing to compromise you know production well if you're making 12 to 15,000 pounds of milk, your milk that you're breeding for, you're not getting the genetic potential out of that cow anyway. Yeah. So why not at least not have horns? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's something that I want to really talk to more farmers about is if you're not pushing for that 25 to 30,000 pounds of milk, breeding pulled, you're not going to, your 12,000 pound cow isn't being pushed at all. And I don't think you're going to lose milk genetically by going with a maybe a minus in milk production cow, a bull, and it's pulled. Uh, it just to me, it's it's a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Now, back in the '90s, we bred uh, pulled Jersey, mm-hmm. and it you bred the milk straight out of that cow. I mean, the heifers had no udders and no horns. I mean, it was it was terrible. Like you were you. 8,000 pounds out of a heifer and it was terrible but you know that was probably 92 93 and there's a there's a farmer in Ohio that has been using that same line of genetics that we used ever since the late 80s when they came out pulled his herd is 100% pulled and he runs over a six fat in his jerseys with 12 to 13,000 pounds of milk so he stuck with it and it worked we used it and panicked so, but yeah. it was still, there's still some of that pulled in my brother-in-law's herd. Mm-hmm. So. I guess it's like a lot of things. If you're, if you're always, if you're always chasing something, you'll never accomplish anything. Like we just decided when we did it, that this is what we're going for. And we just stick with it. Cause, uh, you know, like, like now, if all of a sudden we were to say, God, we sure wish we could have a little bit more milk or something. And we stopped breeding for pulled in a matter of two years, we could, we could undo so much of what has taken five, mm-hmm. six years to gain here. Um, so consistency and, and patience and, and there's a lot of tools available as far as bull selection tools that will pull, you can put criteria in and it'll pull bulls from any stud, you know, or, or from a whole bunch of studs. So yes, are, are we having, we're having to buy semen from several different places in order to accomplish what we're trying to do here but i see the day of that being necessary to find enough bulls is is probably you know the day of that needing to be is is coming to an end here pretty soon Mm -hmm. um but when we the first year we did it i think we got semen from five studs Mm -hmm. i don't even know if there's that many available now Mm -hmm. what is your fat running Fat this summer has been lower than normal. It's running about four, and uh, protein about three two. Currently, um, I like to see the fat, especially in the winter, be around four four, and about three four three five on the protein. 
Um, in the last few years, especially, we've we've been breeding for percents, um, trying to select bulls for higher that that are positive on component percentages instead of pounds, um, to help push solids too. Mm-hmm. So, going back to the pole breeding, do you think with the new animal care standards and things that are coming out, not just in organics, but in, in dairy agriculture in general, uh, do you think you'll be forced to breed pole in the future? Well, I won't be forced to because I no, already am. <laughs> but um, I think that I, I don't want to see that day come, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if the consumer um, gets to the point where that, that will be uh, – just like tail docking, mm-hmm. where it's going to be a decision that's kind of pushed on you whether you want to or not, um, and I and I I think the whole industry sees that. That's why the studs are working so hard to mm-hmm. have an increased lineup of pulled bulls and push for homozygous pulled, so that they can tell you first calf born pulled. Mm-hmm. You know the so it's not just me. I think everybody sees that, mm-hmm. and if you can make a calf that is that is comparable, if not just as good, and you can eliminate the need for dehorning. I just, I don't, I mean, I don't know why people are fighting to keep the job of dehorning. I mean, uh, I mean. Yeah, I don't, I don't get that either. I mean, I, I, I don't like farmers losing choice. Mm-hmm. I don't like people who don't farm and don't understand things at the same level as a farmer coming in and telling you that you have to do something. But for me as a farmer, I'm, I guess I look at it and I personally want to make the choice of not having to dehorn just for myself. And cause I don't like doing something that I know is, um, is going to be a huge stress on my livestock that I'm trying to, you know, raise the best calf I can. That's going to turn into the best cow I, I can raise. And, so for me, the decision to want to do polled is there is the same whether consumers are going to ask me to do it, OV is going to ask me to do it, or I'm just doing it on my own. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know, you know, dehorning versus disbudding, you know, make that clarification there that, you know, at a young age doing the disbudding with the burner versus the old way of mm-hmm. using the loppers. And the story I always tell is uh, I worked on my uncle's farm in southwest Wisconsin, and I told him when I went there, you know, I'm willing to do just about anything, you know, just tell me what I need to do. And, you know, a couple of weeks in, he said, it's time to dehorn calves. And he was one of those that was doing it two times a year, fall and spring with Mm -hmm. the big loppers and we'd get them in the head gate. And I told him after we did that the first time I said, I will, I'm still willing to do almost anything around here, but don't ever ask me to do that again. I will not do it. Mm-hmm. So I completely understand, you know, it's saying that uh, the consumers maybe not understanding what it is that needs to be done on a farm, but seeing it be done as a consumer, I don't want it being done, yeah. you know, and and that old way of doing it, that set the calf back a week. Oh. You know, they're sitting there, you know, pawn at their mm-hmm. head and yeah. flies and, you know, all this different, it's yeah. just a nasty practice. Yeah. In my lifetime, even though I grew up farming, the last time dehorning like you know i understand the distinction between dehorning and disbudding what you're talking about um the last time we dehorned was when i was very young Mm -hmm. and i'm 39 now Mm -hmm. um so the calves that we do have to do yes it's disbudding it's within the first 10 days or two weeks of life Mm -hmm. and um you know there's that obviously that is less stressful Mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to palate as a as a human doing it Mm -hmm. But it's still so much nicer to just wipe all that off of the list of things to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's, I mean, it just makes sense. If you can get comparable bulls that don't have horns, it's, in my opinion, it's a Mm -hmm. no-brainer. But, you know, it's easy for me to be out here preaching. I'm not, I'm not a farmer anymore. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's a certain segment of people that just, hold on to something that much harder if somebody says you should do something different just because they just just don't want to be told to do anything. Well, the independence of being a farmer is what draws a lot of people to farming. So being told to do something, there's going to be pushback. Yeah. And and I, I 
I get that. Nobody wants to be said, this is the way Mm -hmm. you have to do it. Okay, I can make that choice to do it, but to be told it's mandatory, then it becomes an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And I I guess in all things that have to do with dealing with the weather and with animals and so many variables, it does seem like, you know, there are definitely things that I don't mind seeing taken off the table and saying these are absolutely um, – off off limits and and not options anymore but um i guess as a as a whole i don't like seeing too many things be you know especially especially things like that where it's not a chemical or you know mm-hmm. that to say that you absolutely can't do something um it seems like it's kind of it, it in the long run it's probably going to be fine, but there's there's always that chance that at some point we say, oh, we need we need some tool that we don't have anymore. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, in today's market, whether it's conventional or organic, it doesn't matter. There's such competition to for shelf space or to sell milk that there's farmers that are being forced into a position to have to give up stuff because of you know, meeting higher standards Mm -hmm. in order to just sell their milk. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of a push pull, you know, I don't want to take options off the table, but at the same time, if we've got a, if there's a way to move milk, well then I hope people are willing, have an open mind at least. Because somebody will be willing to do it. Yes. Yes. If you're not willing to make concessions and try to have better animal care or whatever, somebody else will. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of the animal care that's being pushed right now, which I don't want to, that's not a bad thing. Everybody should be concerned about animal welfare and taking care of animals. But I think a lot of it is pushed from the stores, the customer, not the consumer, because they want to get ahead of the curve. So when the consumers start complaining or coming to the store, oh no, we have all this in place. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to get, they're pushing for stuff that the consumer might not even be aware of yet, just to stay out ahead. Yeah. So, and then, it comes back on the farmer. The pressure is being put on the farmer to keep the customer happy. So once the consumer finds out about it and is upset that everybody's doing it already. Yeah. For a while, my, my father-in-law was an egg producer for Organic Valley uh, for quite a few years. And when we bought this farm, we we actually ran two flocks of of egg chickens for, for OV. Um, and for several reasons... We don't do that anymore. It wasn't. We were dairy people, and the chickens was kind of always a secondary thing, and the building was going to need a bunch of work. But it was it was a good profit center for us as a farm. But kind of an example of what can happen as as more things are shoved at you to do. Um, the salmonella thing happened, and then there were all these count fly counting and trap monitoring and keeping track of so many things as far as paperwork and being open to a um, FDA inspection at any given time they could you know give you a few hours notice and say we're coming to inspect your building and look at all this paperwork and see all these things that you and I lived I, I that was that was terribly terribly scary for me and when we had an opportunity to when we kind of needed the facility for something else and I I imagined a world where I wasn't concerned about that because there's obviously enough organic paperwork and record keeping for the cows and the fields and stuff to not have to worry about the chicken side of things. I was like, Oh good. I will, I will bow out their long on eggs. And I, I mean, I, I was concerned enough about trying to do it right and be ready and prepared. It was just another thing that was always on my mind. And that's, I guess as a, as a farmer, my concern about regulation and and top down things is at what point do we get farmers to the point where the return, the work, the weather, the finance, you know, the the requirements as far as what does it take to to do gets to the point where where we drive interest away mm-hmm. and and the next generation says, "Gal, you know, farming growing up on the farm was great, but I remember Dad being." stressed out all the time and i remember this and that and i remember him cussing about these regulations and having to keep track of it and i mean at what point do we drive people away and uh and then 
I think the last thing the consumer wants is to have it get down to where farming is controlled by such a small number of big players that they can start to say, no, never mind. Do you want that? Okay, well, do you want to eat? Here's what we're going to make for you. And we're a long ways from that, but but we, I mean, we've seen a lot of change in farming in the last 30 years. And, and if you make it seem like I'm going to work super hard, I'm not going to make a very comfortable living. I'm going to live in fear of somebody coming in and looking at how I'm doing things and telling me that I don't meet criteria. It, it's not difficult for people to say, maybe I'll get a job in town. Mm-hmm. You know, good luck, dad. I'll see you at Christmas and Thanksgiving and whatever, you know, and I don't want that to be mm-hmm. the situation that we get to. And I, and I don't think that OV or anybody in particular, no, nobody wants to get to that, but I think it's something that we have to think about as we move forward that um, we don't create a world where people say farming is just too stressful and not profitable enough. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to make that choice. Mm-hmm. There's already been enough of a move towards, um, you know, jobs in the city, move away from agriculture, move away from rural life. To, I agree with you that yeah. to put more on it, uh, to put more barriers in place yeah. isn't going to help uh, bring that back at all. Mm-hmm. So do you think there is going to be a time when farmers have to say no? I do. I think there will be. I don't know when it is, but... Um, and, and and we probably don't know what the issue will be as of today. I mean, if consumers get to where they, you know, I, I guess I think so many consumers don't have children anymore and they have pets and now pets have become children and pets are really close to what they perceive as farm animals. And so the life that so many pets live now is we don't mistreat our children, but it's probably a better life than our kids have as far as being doted on. And I mean, whatever, whatever can be done for them is, and I'm, and I'm not saying that's wrong or not going to try to stop that, but consumer perspective of what a cow should be allowed to do, or I know how should a calf be taken care of? It's, it's not difficult to see that getting to a point where their perception of that as compared to how they take care of their pet could get to the point where it's like, well, okay, then you're going to have to have your own cow and it's going to have to be in your backyard and you're going to have to milk it and make your own milk because we can't do what you think should be done Mm -hmm. in terms of taking care of this animal Mm -hmm. and have, you know, especially when regulation and all these other things that you've asked us to do has pushed our numbers down to where we as a family of five or six or two are trying to take care of 500 cows because that's how many we have to milk to make a living. And if half of us quit, all of a sudden there's not enough of this product. Um, so what, so, you know, there, we're going to get to a point where people are going to have to either, either adjust what their expectations are, or they're going to have to adjust their taste and eat what fits what they think they want. Because mm-hmm. everybody with the internet, social media, everybody's an expert now. So just like you said with pets, and I don't have a dog. I'm not a crazy, I don't really care for dogs, quite frankly. I'm kind of scared of them. Your little guy was really nice, though. <laughs> Joey? Joey, yeah. And uh, But like an, a, a farm animal and a, and a pet are two different things. Now you can abuse both, mm-hmm. but the, how treating a cow well looks compared to tr- treating your little dog that's in the house is two completely separate ways. Mm-hmm. And you can't you can't treat your cow the same way. Yeah, you can't. I mean they're they're a herd animal and and honestly if you tried to if you tried to individualize her and make her into something akin to a dog a large number of them, especially, I mean, if they were born and raised that way, one thing, but to take an animal that's a herd animal and make her try to live the life that, that some people might think that she, you know, especially an, 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 a naive consumer who doesn't understand, take a cow and that cow would, would go crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it wouldn't want that. And 
I mean, the distinction between a pet and a, it's a production animal. It's a loved production animal. I mean, we care deeply about our herd. I mean, they, they are, they are part of our family. We work, we work 365 days a year, almost other than a little break here or there when we can make it work. But we work, we put in way more hours doing work that most people would not want to do, would not enjoy if it's not what you're, if it's not what you are destined for or not what you dream about. And so to say that we would do something that is harmful to them, um, now it, it does happen, I know. I know there are cases, but as a whole, uh, taking care of that animal is, that's that's our whole life. You know, mm-hmm. and and I, when I say that animal, I mean that herd. Those they're they're the future. Um, they're the future of our of our business and everything that we do. We're trying to make them happy, comfortable, productive, because that's how we make our living. Well, I think uh, that about wraps it up. Really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, this was fun. I. I look forward to learning more about this whole podcast thing. I've never listened to one, so maybe I'll have to get into this a little bit. We can show you how. (laughs) Thank you.